Well, if you would stand with me now as we come to the Bible, let's stand together. We're looking this morning at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and uh, you'll find it on page 968 in the church Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and uh, I'll be reading from verse 6 through to verse 15. We come now to God's Word, His Word that is life and health, peace, food, expression of His love for you, His Word to you. And so now as we come to His Word, let's open our hearts to receive it and honor him who gave it to us. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9 beginning at verse 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all your generosity, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission, flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you, because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Do please sit down. Well, I wanted to begin this morning by asking us to stand and hear God's word read in that way because we do that with some regularity at College Church to honor the God who gave us his word and to put our minds and our hearts in the right frame of mind to receive his word. But this theme that we're looking at this morning of generosity, of, of money, it's a particularly touchy subject in church. Um, the defenses go up. And, of course, the reason for that is not hard to discover. We have all come across teachings, um, tele-evangelists, messages, um, perhaps sermons in a church somewhere that you have heard that, frankly, have been manipulative when it comes to the subject of money. I remember sitting in one vast auditorium listening to a person preach on this theme of money, and it was, as I say, frankly manipulative. With each rush of rhetoric as the offering plates were passed, uh, yet more money was put in the plate. (laughs) I even remember someone right in front of me taking out a credit card and putting it in the offering plate. And of course, the message of uh, this kind of thing that we're all familiar with today is pretty simple. It is, you give money to me, 
and you'll get even more in return. Well, they don't quite put it like that, but that's, that's what they're saying. And all this, naturally enough, creates a kind of communication static around the idea of money in church. Interestingly, the same is not, 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 quite, not quite the same outside of church. Uh, it is fairly common for 501c3 charitable organizations to have a, a fancy banquet where people come along and they hear about the opportunity to give. And no one's embarrassed about asking for it. They'll have music. They'll have a, a guest speaker. They'll, they'll, without any sense of shame or difficulty, just ask you to give. But in church, because of this communication static, Well, there are many churches that never teach on it at all for fear of all the defenses that will be raised. But while there are many churches that never teach on the subject of money at all, the Bible does teach on the subject of money. Quite a lot, actually. Um, of course, Jesus does, doesn't he? Uh, he? He talks about money a lot. Um, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Um, lay up treasures in heaven where rust, uh, ru- rust and, and moth cannot destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. He, he, he teaches about money. And so does Paul. Paul. And the uh, passage that we've just read out here, let me just give you some of the background so you can see how it fits in together with what Paul is saying. We're obviously in 2 Corinthians, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in, in, in the Bible. And what's, what's going on is that Paul is writing a letter to these Corinthian Christians to really defend his ministry. So the Corinthians had received um, false teachers, uh, um, Um, super apostles, um, false apostles, who come in and and criticized the apostle Paul and attacked his ministry. Uh, They had said, uh, Paul is not much of a speaker. Uh, They had said, uh, uh, Paul is impressive in writing, but weak in person. Uh, And in particular, they had said, Paul keeps on changing his travel plans. And a guy like that, you see, you cannot trust. Certainly not with your money. And therefore, Paul writes uh, this second letter to the Corinthians to defend his ministry. Not because he's concerned about himself, but because he's concerned about the gospel that he planted in the Corinthian church. And therefore, he needs to defend himself in order to defend the gospel. And in particular, in this section we're looking at, he talks a lot about money. And the reason for that is Paul had this ambition. His ambition was that having planted many churches among the Gentiles and aware that in Jerusalem, among the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, there was a famine, uh, there was real poverty and suffering among those Jewish Christians. He had an ambition that he would demonstrate to the Jewish Christians that the Gentile Christians really were followers of God by what we often call the Jerusalem gift. So he was advocating to the Gentile churches that they would give money to relieve the poor, the saints, the poor in Jerusalem. And his purpose for that was so that the Jerusalem Christians would realize that really those Gentiles had become Christians. And they really were united as one people under the Messiah, Jesus. And so he needs to defend his ministry in order that this Jerusalem gift that he's been advocating for with the Corinthian Christians would continue to go ahead. Because the false teachers have been saying, Paul's the kind of guy you cannot trust, and therefore you cannot trust him with his money, and therefore they were now behind in their giving, you see. So that's the context. And he comes then to this, this sort of central section here when he's talking about money, and uh, it begins in verse 6. You ask me, well, what is the main point of this passage? Well, conveniently enough, Paul directly tells us what his point is. Look at verse 6. 
You know, if you're ever confused about, I think, this, I think this is probably the easiest passage in the whole Bible to figure out what the main point is. Look at verse 6. The point is this. Well, there you go. You know, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. There is a paradigm, a, uh, a shape, a mentality that Paul wants the Corinthians to have about giving generosity money. And it's quite different from the one we tend to have. You and I, and the Corinthians, tend to think of giving like this. When we give, we no longer have what we gave, and someone else has it instead. When you give, therefore you lose something. It's obvious, isn't it? I mean, here, I, here it is. You know, I've got some keys in my pocket. Um, if I give you my keys, I no longer have them. You have them. That's what it means to give. No, says Paul. That's not how it works in the kingdom. You've got the wrong, the wrong paradigm, the wrong framework, the wrong attitude, the wrong way of thinking about it. No, in the kingdom of God, giving is like sowing. You sow a seed, you reap a harvest. It's not like giving and losing. A farmer doesn't think to himself, well, if I sow these seeds in the ground, I'm going to lose these seeds. No. He's sowing the seeds so that he'll get a harvest. Our mentality is giving and losing. The Bible's mentality, how giving and generosity works in the kingdom of God, is sowing and reaping. It, it, it's a completely different way of thinking about, uh, about money, about giving. It, it's, it's a total paradigm shift. And if there's one thing about, above all other things that you could get this morning, it would be this. You know, the point is this. If there's one thing that you could get clear in your mind, that we could get clear in our minds as a church, it would be to think of giving, not as this framework of giving and therefore losing, but of sowing and therefore reaping. Now, there's a, a, corral, a corollary to that, a consequence to that. So, sparingly, reap sparingly. So, bountifully, reap bountifully. So, the corollary to this, the consequence to this, the the way of thinking about this that he, he, he lays out in this main point, the point is this, is not just sowing and reaping, it's sowing sparingly, reap sparingly. So bountifully reap bountifully. In other words, it's an investment. You're investing. Jesus says the same, of course, doesn't he? You know, lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. You're investing. You're not losing. You're investing. You're sowing. And it's a total paradigm shift, and therefore it changes the kind of way you're thinking about it. You think, well, if that's the case, if it is about sowing and reaping, why would I sow sparingly? Which farmer who has a field in front of him would only sow a few seed when he has the opportunity to sow a lot of seed? He would sow a lot with great generosity, with great liberality, with great bountifulness, a lot of seed because it's sowing and reaping, not giving and losing. Now, that's the main point, but of course, you know, say, well, okay, what does that mean? What kind of sowing? What kind of reaping? How does that work together? So, Paul now begins to work out throughout the rest of the passages the implications of this. Well, the first one is in verse 7. Look at verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart to give. 
In other words, this is not compulsion, therefore. It's voluntary. No one is to manipulate you to give. You're to do as you've decided in your own heart. There's no compulsion, no force. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart to give. He goes on, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful Uh, God loves a cheerful giver. God does not want us miserable, begrudging, grieving givers. He wants cheerful, happy, rejoicing, excited, exuberant, um, upward, smiling givers. Well, why is that? How, How can you be cheerful about giving? Surely when you give, you're losing, and you may have a responsibility. Okay, I need to give feel kind of sad about it, but I'm going to give, and I'm not going to have so much afterwards, but okay, I'll give you something. But if it is like sowing and reaping, then it's a cheerful thing. You're sowing and there's going to be a harvest. God loves a cheerful giver. And what, what that means then for us is when, when the subject of giving in church comes up, It really shouldn't be a touchy subject. You know, when uh, we have an announcement in church, and you know know how it works often, you know, that we're behind in our budget. So if someone comes up to the pulpit and makes an announcement, we're behind in our budget, you can hear the kind of, um, the, the unvoiced, but nonetheless in the atmosphere, sort of groans around the congregation, oh no. I guess I'm going to have to give a little bit more. Oh, well, okay. I guess I will. Now, I get that. I mean, I, the, the, the money does have its tentacles all around us, me included, for all of us in this materialistic Western world that we live in. I understand that. But if we, if we could grasp what Paul is saying, what the Bible is saying, instead, it, it wouldn't be like that at all. It wouldn't be, you know, the, the theme of generosity, the topic of generosity would not be like going to the dentist, You know, I guess I'd better go to the dentist. Does anyone want to go to the dentist? You know, sorry for any dentist out there, but we love you. But, you know, I guess I'd better go. I sure hope there's going to be some Novocaine when I get there. It shouldn't be like that. It should be, wow, I have another opportunity to invest. Because I'm sewing and reaping. It should be an exciting moment in church. God loves a cheerful giver, like, like baptisms. Baptisms, you know, when, when a baptism happens here, everyone kind of claps and applauds and goes, yeah, isn't that wonderful? What, sim-? Of course, that's about salvation. But giving, as we'll see in a moment, actually reflects the gospel. And when people are giving, it should be this like, oh, yeah, wow, that's great. I have another opportunity. God loves a cheerful giver. Well, okay, you say, but uh, how's that going to make me cheerful? Why is that? Well, Paul goes on to explain more of it in verses 8 through to 11. Again, he's working out this main idea of sowing and reaping, that giving is not losing something. It's sowing something. And so verses 8 to 11, look down with me at that. First of all, he says this. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things, at all times, you may abound in every good work. In other words, you're not going to lose out. And we're thinking about generosity, but of course, really, the ultimate theme is not our generosity. It's that we worship a generous God. He is able to make all grace abound to you, 
so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. All things, all times, abound in every good work. This is, this is the kind of God we worship College Church. He's a generous God. He, you're not going to lose out. Now, so there's a law of the harvest, sowing and reaping, that he's sort of playing out. But now, what makes this tricky to explain in all this communication static about money today is that there's this message, isn't there, that's out there called the prosperity gospel. And uh, the prosperity gospel, as I alluded to at the beginning, basically says that if you give money to God, you'll become prosperous, you'll, you'll be healthy, if you have enough faith, you'll be rich, this kind of thing. But of course, the promise here is not material. It is also saying that it, 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 that it could, it's not also not saying that it could never be material. It isn't limited that way. It's, it's actually more than that. We don't have a worse message than the, go- the prosperity gospel. We have a better message. We're not preaching a poverty gospel. You'll be enriched, as we'll see in a moment, in every way. It, what, what, what is so cruel about the prosperity gospel is people suffer. I'm a pastor. I know there are people suffering that I'm speaking to right now. And the prosperity comes, gospel comes along and says, if you only had enough faith, if you, if you only did the right thing, then you wouldn't be suffering. You'd have all the money you could possibly hope. And it's so cruel. It robs Christians of good deaths. It robs Christians of the joy that there can be found even in the midst of suffering. But we don't have a worse message than the prosperity gospel. We have a better one because, because God is able to make all grace abound to you. He gives you a great storehouse of seed. It's, it's a matter of being a steward of what God has given you. All the gifts he has given you, all the talents he has given you, the life he has given you, the resources he has given you, the time he has given you, that you then give to to others so that he can flood even more into you, so that then you can give even more to others. What makes the prosperity gospel so tricky is that there are parts of it that are true. That's the way it always is with heresies. No one would believe them if everything that they said was wrong. It is true that giving is like sowing and that when we give, we receive a harvest. True. It is true that we will have from God, who is able to make all grace abound, we'll have from Him all sufficiency in all things at all times. True. But it is not true that this necessarily means prosperous in the sense of material money or health. Uh, Jesus says, blessed are the poor. He says it's easier for A camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. But that does not mean that God will not make sure that we have all we need so that we can bound in all situations at all times in every every good work. As Paul says here, there there is a connection between sowing and reaping. You say, how does that work? Well, Paul goes on to explain further. Look at verse 9. As it is written, he is distributed freely, he is given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. So again, this is about sowing. The picture here, the word he uses is distributing, but it's the same idea of sowing into our lives, this generous God. Well, how does that work out? He continues in verses 10 and 11. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. The same law of harvest, of sowing 
and reaping. It's been developed further here. God supplies seed to the sower. There's, of course, there's a human way that seed is found. But ultimately, Paul's saying it all comes from God. And in the same way, God will supply and indeed multiply your seed for sowing and therefore increase the harvest of righteousness. So it's not just talking about material results. It's bigger than that. It's a harvest of righteousness. But this is also not restrictive or spiritual in the sense sometimes we use it, meaning vague or impractical. No, he says you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. You sow, you reap a harvest. You sow a lot, you reap a lot. God this way provides for you more seed to sow, and that means you can sow even more and reap even more. That's how sowing and reaping works. That's how farmers think. That's how we are to think. This is the paradigm shift that is then being worked out and its various consequences of thinking about giving as not giving and losing, but sowing and reaping. You're not losing when you give. You are sowing. There is, and there is a harvest coming. One illustration um, is of a man I, I, I know who had always been a regular giver to the church. He'd always given pretty much every Sunday. He'd come along and put the appropriate amount into the offering plate. He'd always given to the church. But one year, for some reason, he was particularly um, extravagant in his giving. And as he told, uh, a year or two later, he was given the biggest job he'd ever had in his life, a huge uh, raise, and was therefore able to give even more. Now, it doesn't always work like that. That's where the prosperity gospel gets it wrong, but it does sometimes. Sometimes it will be more spiritual, truly. Uh, another illustration would come from a, a student I, 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 I know who was also giving to the church, but, but of course not very much, but one time he gave a particular amount to something the church needed. It was in proportion to what the church had as its budget, very minimal. But the giving that he did encouraged uh, those who received uh, the giving. The, you know, here at College Church, we have a whole system of checks and balances on the giving. So the, uh, all the different ways that it happens here to make sure everything's done with fiduciary responsibility, etc. It encouraged those folk. And not only that, in that student's life, it opened up channels of increasing maturity spiritually and opportunity for ministry. He sowed, he reaped. Of course, Jesus' illustration is of the widow's might. There are all these people giving a lot of money in the, in the temple and uh, Jesus is watching as they're giving and that's fine, Jesus doesn't criticize them for their giving, but the person he pointed out was the person who gave just a very small amount of money because it expressed her heart and she was giving all that she had while well, she sowed. You say, well, where's the harvest? What greater harvest could there be than to have your life story recorded in the Bible and for all eternity be held up for honor by the Lord Jesus himself. 
As you give, as you sow, there will be a harvest in your life. Therefore, be a cheerful giver. Therefore, be excited about it, like thrilled about it. Like, I get an opportunity to give. Wow, I'm sowing. There's a new investment opportunity opening up for me. That's great. So we've seen the principle, sowing and reaping. That's what giving is like, not giving and losing. We've seen the consequences of that, uh, that we should not give under compulsion, but cheerfully. And we've begun to tease out the effects of that same principle of sowing and reaping. When, when we give, we'll experience a harvest, and there's a lot to be cheerful about when we sow, therefore. But, but Paul then finally, in this passage, presses into this more. He, he cannot leave it so potentially... Um, misunderstood or vague and unspecified. And so at the end of verse 11, he says it will produce thanksgiving to God, but what does that mean? And so Paul then explains what it means in verses 12 to 15 in this last final section. And what he's saying here really is that what happens when we give like this, when we sow like this, is that it elevates, the sowing and the reaping, is that it elevates the gospel of Christ. Now here's what he says. So look down with me at verse 12. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. In other words, while this particular Jerusalem gift was to alleviate the needs of the poor Christians in Jerusalem, that, that's not what it, all that it did by any means. No, this giving, this sowing and reaping is about far more than that. The giving itself, Paul says, is a ministry to begin with. I want you to notice that. It's a ministry. You know, we often reserve the word ministry for those who are in full-time Christian work or being paid by a Christian organization or ordained or something like that. But no, this is a ministry. Perhaps you have a particular capacity to give. I want to encourage you. That giving is not just a support to ministry. It is ministry. This ministry you have. But then Paul also says this giving, this sowing, is doing a lot more than merely supplying the needs of the saints. Now, it is doing that. There is a need. Paul communicates that need. There's nothing wrong with communicating a need. He did. Here is a need. Let's give so that we can meet that need. Paul has explained the need of the Jerusalem poor. But there's far more than that going on. What, what is that? He says, it is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. So the real point is praise to God, giving thanks to God. The, the real point is that God is praised. That's what we're aiming for. That's the ultimate harvest that we want, that God be praised. You say, well, how does that happen? Look at verse 13. By their approval of this service, they receive it and accept it and therefore approve the gift. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from the confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. So when the Jerusalem Christians receive this gift, they will glorify or praise God because it is a sign that the Gentile Christians really are Christians. That they really have received the gospel of Christ. That they now are a symbol and a sign of the power of God through his gospel. They'll say, wow, those Gentile Christians, isn't God at work in them? Isn't that gospel of God so powerful? Isn't this generous God that we worship so amazing? 
And what that means is that your giving, your sowing produces a harvest, not only of God's provision for you, which is true, in all ways, at all times, every need and all sufficiency, yes. But not only that, and not only does it produce a harvest of thanksgiving to God, people praise God, it does it because it shows that the gospel is powerfully at work in you. They will long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. They'll say, wow, those guys really did receive the gospel. They really have confessed the gospel. They really have submitted to God because of the gospel. So Paul concludes all this teaching on giving, on sowing, on reaping by elevating it to this level. It reflects, honors, esteems, holds high, witnesses to the gospel. It causes people to praise God because of the gospel. As he concludes, verse 15, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Now, which gift, Paul? The gift of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, the power of God in this gospel that takes a selfish, money-grabbing, materialistic, pagan Corinthian and turns him and her into a visual representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ and of the character of our generous God in the way they are now giving. This must be the kind of God that we worship because they are so generous. It must be because they have received such extraordinary generosity from God. Let me summarize it all like this. You come to church, you hear about money, you've heard other pastors or other churches or seen people on TV talk about money. And the defenses go right up. But here comes Paul. And he has quite a different attitude to money. Giving is not giving away or losing. Giving is sowing. And he does not want to force anyone to give. He's not manipulating anyone. It's not under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. It's an investment opportunity. This is because there's a harvest, a reaping that comes of the law of the harvest from your generous sowing. Look at your giving and don't look at it and say what you must do. Look at it and say what I could do. How many more seeds could I sow? It's all honor in God and it shows the the work of God in my life and and that I've received the gospel and I believe in a God of grace and generosity. What, What could I do? He's going to supply all my needs. What could I do? Or look at it like this. Perhaps you're not a Christian. You're not sure whether you are one yet. And you come to church and you hear a sermon on money. Does this confirm in your mind that churches do nothing but talk about money? It's fulfilling all your caricatures. We planned this sermon uh, for uh, a good six months or more ago. It's not something we do all the time. It is disconnected by its long planning from any particular need that we might have as a church. It is for your good. There is a harvest in your life perhaps that you want. Perhaps you want to know God better or to discover the meaning of life or to understand that, that, that philosophy you've been trying, that text you've been trying to read and understand it and grasp it and get the spiritual insight you need. Perhaps you want to make a difference with your life and be a part of um, relieving the poor in this Jerusalem gift kind of way. You want, to, you want to be a part of making a difference in this world. And all of this comes out of receiving the grace of God in Christ opening his inexpressible gift for you 
that you too might become a person of generosity and that God might therefore be praised and you might have cheerfulness, joy, celebration. Moving past a famine mentality to a generosity mentality. You now serve a God of grace. And by sowing and reaping, a harvest to his glory. Let's pray together. We're going to sing in a moment this last hymn, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. Would you ask that God fills your heart with thankfulness for all that he has done for you? Perhaps you don't know him at all. Would you take this moment to confess your sins and turn to him in faith that your heart might be filled with thankfulness? Receive this inexpressible gift of salvation. Would you uh, pray that God would give you a heart of thankfulness, of cheerfulness, of joy as you look at your giving and ask that God gives you wisdom to know how you could, what you could do to invest in his kingdom, to sow into his harvest field. Ask God to give you wisdom and faith that he will supply all your needs. Oh Lord God, we do pray that you would indeed fill our heart with thankfulness and become increasingly a people of generosity as you are such a generous God. In the name of Jesus, amen.